Good evening. Welcome to church tonight. Let's stand together, open up singing about the greatness of God. This, this first chorus comes right out of the scriptures. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Let's sing together. Greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Mighty is our God. Mighty is our Thank you for coming to the uh, week, uh, midweek service. Uh, we definitely have a lot to pray about tonight. And I uh, just want to read something to you real quick, something that I saw and heard someone say, um, and I, it's anonymous, so I don't know. Prayer is an invitation to an, 
to an extravagant banquet where everything we will ever need is present. That's pretty good. And um, I don't take this time that we have, just the, the few moments that we take here to pray for the needs, physical, um, in, in our church. And, uh, but it's something certainly to think about when we're thinking about when we go to prayer to God during the week, not just today and not just on Sunday. And so there, there are a lot of, a lot of uh, prayer needs tonight from our church. But before I get into those, we do want to pray for several things that are actually on your little, um, your little bulletins here, okay? So you can grab those always at the Welcome Center. Uh, we want to pray over our men's ministry. And we do want to pray for our staff member, Ms. Blaylock, Ms. Grace Blaylock. Our home missionary is Joel Franks uh, out in Athens, Alabama. Our foreign missionary is John Grunewald from Togo, Africa, and then of course our missionary of the month that we've been praying for, Daniel Spear in Japan. And so there's, there's a lot of family needs and the, 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 act, the actual list there that you have in front of you uh, might include like maybe two or three more, but um, I wanna read a scripture to you. And uh, just thinking about prayer and just thinking about, you know, coming to God the Father. In Mark chapter 18, verse 19, the word of God said, you said, this is what Jesus says, that if the two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask it, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. What a promise. What a promise that we have to be able to go to the Lord in prayer. And so um, as you look at those, I've just mentioned some of these, some of these, but I'll, I'll pray over all of these tonight. But um, a couple of the new ones here, uh, Ms. Yolanda uh, Amato, uh, had an injury to her finger, and she's uh, she's needing you know that finger to really heal, and so just talking to her yesterday, so she I know that she's very little bit nervous about that finger, and so we're asking that God would heal her of that. She's supposed to be seeing someone, I believe, either today or tomorrow, and uh, so certainly we want to lift her up in prayer. Uh, Michael Hall has an upcoming surgery, and so we want to just pray that God would just uh, help him, uh, just get prepared for that. Uh, Miss Myra Jones, uh, as you know, is back in the hospital um, at UNC, and let me tell you folks, she needs nothing short of a miracle, and I know that's everybody here on this list that we will pray for, but she needs nothing short of a miracle, and so we're asking the Lord to, to really be with her, and so, um, and then some others, um, I'm thinking about Miss Vonda Boone, who's still in rehab, Brother Ca uh, Paul Campbell, who still needs relief from the shingles, he's, he's struggling with that, um, Brother Ernie Holder, who's in hospice care, uh, Wendy Smith with her health, uh, Sister Shirley Sorrell with the treatments that she's taking. And so there's just a lot of requests here tonight. And so as you're looking on with those and as you're seeing those on the screen uh, behind me, I'm looking at the screen up there, let's, let's call some of these out and ask, uh, ask the Lord to, to, um, to just do what he does best, and that is he answers our prayer, okay, when we call on him. Father, thank you that, uh, that we can come tonight and uh, we can make our request known. God, we're your children, and uh, we certainly do come boldly, we come humbly, but we come in Jesus' name. We, we ask God that you would help these needs now, Father, there are so many on our list tonight. We thank you, Lord, first of all, for the men's ministry. We thank you for the, the great group of number of men that we have in our church. It's one of the reasons why we're strong like we are, so we thank you for that. We pray that you would keep blessing and, and continue to bring men that love Jesus Father, we pray for our staff member. We pray for Grace. We pray that you would help her uh, during the school year. We pray that, God, that you would give her um, just favor with those kids that she teaches. We do, Lord, we ask, God, that you would pray, pray for uh, Joel in, uh, in Athens, Alabama. We pray that the work there um, would, uh, would be successful and that they are reaching folks for the cause of Christ. Thank you for our foreign missionary, uh, Brother John, who's in Togo, Africa. We are reaching beyond uh, Wake County. We're reaching beyond North Carolina and even our states. And Father, will you love the world? For God so loved the world. And so we thank you for Brother John. We ask God that you would be uh, with him and just use him. And thank you for our missionary of the month. As we continue to pray for Brother Daniel in Japan, we, we ask, Lord, that, uh, that you would just, um, just be with him as he ministers, continues to minister there and just use him. Lord, there's, there's a lot of uh, needs tonight, a lot of physical needs in our, in our church family. And Lord, we just want to lift those up to you, Lord. We, we ask God that you would be with Miss, uh, Miss Yolanda as she's, she's got that injury to her finger. We pray that you would just touch her. She needs healing from that. 
Lord, we thank you that um, Amanda has got upcoming test results. We, we know that you can answer the prayer for her. We pray for her even now. I know that she's in the service tonight. We ask God that you would help her. Lord, I've been praying, and I know a lot of us have been praying for Miss Vonda. Lord, we just ask God that you would just be gracious and merciful to her, God, as she continues uh, to, to be in rehab there at the hospital. And Father, I, I know that there was an, a, a closed door uh, for Miss Marriott Campbell. We pray, Father, that uh, soon that you would open a door for her, God, because as she's dealing with some health issues. And uh, so we're asking God that you would show her favor. And God, Brother Paul Campbell, has, he's had some weeks upon weeks of, uh, of dealing with these shingles, and I know that he is hurting. I pray, Father, that you would just bring him relief. I pray, Lord, that you would be with Brother Joe Green, who's got his treatments. I, I spoke and I even saw Brother Joe this afternoon, and he said he was just as weak as he could be, and I just pray that you would give him strength during this time of these treatments. Lord, I pray that you'd be with uh, Brother Michael Hall as he has an upcoming surgery. Prepare his heart. Prepare him uh, to be able to get through with that. And, be, and we ask, Lord, that that surgery would be successful. Uh, Father, we pray that you would uh, continue to be with Brother John as he is in rehab. Oh, just little steps, little steps for him. And thank you for you have been gracious to him. Thank you for Brother Ernie. What a, what a, just a tender, loving man. I know that today when we talked Lord, Brother Ernie said he was ready. He was ready to meet the master. So I just pray that you continue to be with him and, and give him grace. Uh, Lord, Miss Myra, he, she needs nothing short of a miracle, as I said. But she has asked that everything that's being done right now, the test and all of the, uh, the, the treatments that she's getting, we, she's praying that everything would go smooth, that the doctors would, would, uh, would find further uh, treatments and know how to, how to treat her and what's going on in her body. And uh, she has prayed that, um, that she would have no severe side effects from, uh, from what's going on with her um, there at the hospital. So we ask that you would be with her. God, be with Jonathan as he's taking treatments as well. We pray that you would strengthen him. Touch Sister Wendy as she's dealing with those health needs in her life. I pray that you would encourage her by your Holy Spirit. And God, be with Miss Leah as uh, she's dealing with her health as well. God, what precious, precious saints. Father, we, we ask, God, that you would just touch Miss Shirley Sorrell. We pray that you would uh, help her with no side effects. I know that she's been taking some treatments. She started those, and I pray that you would just be with her. Father, we, just, we ask that you would help us, God, to continually pray, continually, continually seek, continually knock, and, we, and as we ask, God, that you would continue to, to do what you can only do, Father. We pray that, God, that you would meet the needs of these, uh, of these folks. Father, help us to be fervent in our prayers. Lord, we know your grace is sufficient for, these, uh, for all of these and the requests that we have before you. Lord, we pray, God, that your will would be done. Your complete will be done. We thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. How many of you have someone that's, uh, that's on your heart that, um, that needs salvation, that is not saved? Okay. Um, we want to go to the Lord in prayer now and just call those names as I call uh, and I have someone on my mind. That, uh, that the Lord has, has put on my heart. Why don't you do that while uh, we pray for that? Lord, thank you that, that we can come again to the throne room, and thank you again that we can pray for those that are diseased with sin, that soul that uh, is that loved one, that friend. And God, I'm, I'm thinking about some people tonight in my life, a neighbor, God, that I constantly say hey to, and, and I try to get him to talk to me or even just open up a conversation. Well, Lord, that soul, my neighbor, has missed the mark, just like so many others that we have on our, on our hearts tonight. Now, Lord, we pray that you would uh, help us, God, to continually pray for them. Now, Father, they not only need a life-changing decision, but, God, they need Jesus because it's an eternal decision. And so, Lord, we're asking, God, that, um, that you would just use us. God, use us as your vessels. And uh, so, Lord, we, we ask, God, that um, whoever that is, give us favor with them, Holy Spirit, give us boldness, and we just thank you for allowing us to be able to pray for these needs tonight. What a sweet, sweet spirit that is in this place because of you. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, just two announcements. Uh, the, the not, if you're doing any offering, tonight's offering is going to go to the Needy Fund. And also, we still need your help with desserts for the Southeastern freshmen who are going to be with us uh, this Sunday 
August the 28th, okay? And uh, you can sign up at the board outside in the foyer online, or you can see Miss Judy Yunkin, okay? Thank you so much, Brother Zach. Let's stand together one more time and invite Christ and meet us here. This song, Come Thou Fount, Come Thou King. Come Thou Fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing Thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, all oh, for songs of loudest praise. Teach me songs. singing please be seated well it's good to see everybody in the lord's house tonight appreciate you coming and being a part uh, of our midweek uh, service of course uh, we have a lot that goes on on wednesday night as you well know if you uh, walk around you're going to see the children's ministry and then uh, we have the teens having teen church and then uh, we have our verge our single adult ministry uh, and then you are stuck with the pastor isn't that great and so uh you're supposed to say amen, okay, and be happy about that. Sometimes you're stuck with Mark, so it could be worse, right? And uh, there we go. I knew I'd get a few amens on that. Even Mark amen me, which is uh, interesting. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. It is good to see uh, some of the Southeastern students that, that are here with us tonight. Appreciate them, and, and uh, I do appreciate uh, the college and what it means to me personally, how it helped train me in those formative days. Matter of fact, I told my I told my wife I, I I know she didn't pick up on it but it was um this is this is gonna blow their minds but it'll it'll some of you will identify it was 1983 on this day I know yeah I don't look that old but 1983 on this day I answered a call to preach at Southeastern 
And, uh, and so that'll, that'll put, they're doing arithmetic now. Freshman at 1983 means he's, and Mark would simply say, the preacher is, there we go. And so, but you're ugly, so yeah, hey. <laughs> oh, just picking. Mark and I are going to be doing a series together. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be doing a short series here uh, before we start a new one. And, and I, occasionally I like to do this for obvious reasons. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about finances. Matter of fact, we together will pair up uh, every other week, he and I, and on Wednesday night, we're going to spend some time talking about a biblical perspective of finances. And one of the reasons why it's important to do that is simply because I believe that uh, if you're one of those people that think that, that the preacher should never get up and talk about money, well, there'd be a whole lot of Bible that I could not preach because the Word of God certainly does. Now, if you're here and, and you're worried about me talking about you giving to the church, this sermon, sermon's not about that at all. Matter of fact, um, in, in the 30 plus years I've served here, I've never had to make a big deal about that because our people are so faithful to give. And so that's not the issue, not even what I want to talk about. But I do believe God has a perspective about finances that's important for us to, to understand. And God says some things about it that are certainly worthy of our time to, to, to think about, invest, and even incorporate uh, in our lives. And that really is, is the direction I want to go. And so 1 Timothy chapter 6, everything that I say will come right from this text starting in verse 6 all the way to verse 10. And just because I want you to stand one more time to honor God's word and uh, make sure that you're awake, uh, those are two objectives. Go ahead and stand. Let's pay honor to God and His word. We'll start reading in verse 6. The Bible says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. We can stop right there. The whole message could be preached on that. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. Now, having food and raiment, let us therewith be content, or therewith content, be therewith content. Sorry, I said that backwards. But they that uh, will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and a many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men into destruction and perdition. Now, I want to stop and say what needs to be said when you read every passage in context. The Word of God is... is, is clearly uh, going to tell you of individuals that were financially stable, and we would even use the word rich. Um, Job would fit that category twice. Um, Abraham, not fair and too bad. Um, I, I could even could go and little, talk about Joseph uh, after he was sucking in the kingdom. and I, I, You get the point. Questions never in my mind been as I have been serving the Lord and preaching to people just like you for years and years. Questions never been whether you have money. The question is whether money has you. And, uh, and that is always going to be the address that I, 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 the perspective that I take when I talk about this. And so I will say for someone who is financially stable, there is no doubt, there is no doubt that you're going to have more in the area of temptation than somebody that's barely making ends meet. And that's what the Bible is warning about. There, there are certainly temptations that's going to come down the path. And I believe that really more than anything else, it's going to be the, the temptation of pride and self-sufficiency, which causes there to be some issues there. And that's why that verse is there. All right, let's go on to verse 10. For the love of money, not money, but the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, Notice the strength of, of loving money. And pierced himself through with many sorrows. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that we have this opportunity uh, to be able to talk about, uh, talk about your perspective of finances. And any time I do marriage counseling, I, I have sessions where I talk about this. And I even look over this auditorium right now and see so many younger couples that are here. And Father, how important it is for us to understand what you say in the area of finances. Bless, bless my preaching. Bless the teaching from your word. I pray you are honored by what is said. In Jesus' name, and amen. You may be seated. It's been a while now, but, but years ago... Diane Sawyer introduced the world to this freewheeling, self-made millionaire, and his name was Mark Cuban. That's a more common name now, but it wasn't so uh, a little better than 20 years ago. And 
she had him on the on on her talk show interviewing him on on the, the newscast that she was a part of back in that day and she defined that, that he was wealthy because of his fortune in computer and in internet business and by the way he got involved in, in the IT world when it was just in the upswing he, he couldn't have timed it better became an extremely fortunate and an extremely wealthy man and on the show he talked about his lavish toys and his Gulfstream jet and and and, and even by and the Dallas Maverick basketball team, which was actually why he was on the show. And uh, people were oohing and on about all of the things this young, very rich man had to say. And Diane Sawyer asked him, do you, do you live by the motto that I hear so many wealthy people do, he who dies with the most toys wins? And Mark Cuban answered, he said, no, I live by this motto. He who lives with the life he wants wins. They're both wrong. They're both wrong. I, I, I'm pausing for effect. Is it taking effect? Because, in all honesty, the philosophy that I believe that should be taught to God's people is the only full and happy life that you will ever have is in accordance with finding and fulfilling the will of God. I believe that from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. I remember so much so wanting to be a highway patrolman, lined up, was already had the man that told me he would sponsor me, but I had to wait till I was 21, and I went to the wilds. God got a hold of my heart. I blame Fred Carraway, Miss Jones, for it today. God got a hold of my heart of the wilds, and God dealt with me strongly in the area of preaching, and I changed my direction, my life's direction, not to be a highway patrolman, uh, but to be a pastor, a preacher of God's Word. I believe I'm doing God's will right now. I believe I'm in the middle of what God called me to do. And I do believe that I would not be fulfilled and happy had I not followed what God's plan was for my life. That does not... Be I did not say, I do not believe a man who will be a highway patrolman would not be happy because we have so many law enforcement officers in our church. We're one of the few churches I know of that our whole security team is made up of law enforcement people, only law enforcement people. And I'm not saying they do not have a, a happy and full life because I believe God does call some for that. But I believe that I'm fulfilling God's will. And the only true mode of happiness is for me to find and to do the will of God. I jokingly told my wife not long ago, we were just talking at the house, and I said, you know, had I followed the track of being a highway patrolman, I would be retired right now. Which is true, by the way, because if I went in at 21, I'm a, uh, and I would be retired. So, um, yeah, I'm, that's right, I'm, I'm, I'm 51. Not. Bottom line, we do not live by the standard of the world. Neither should we try to live by the standard of the world. But I am going to make a statement that we do need to hear. I am not for you living for money, but I'm also not ignorant that you do not need money to live. I'm not a person here that doesn't need money to make ends meet. Matter of fact, I have counseled and talked to some that they had a whole lot more month at the end of their money. And that's never a good place to be. Now, with that said and done, <laughs> I, um, I want you to have a different mindset about it. Now, the sad truth is, too many of God's people have um, never really attempted to properly manage what God has blessed them with financially. That's just a fact. And um, I would dare say some people even look at what I'm saying as not being a spiritual thing, and they've never even prayed about their finances I think it interesting. Uh, you can read this in Dave Ramsey's material. This is exactly where this came from, giving credit where credit is due. He said since 1980, the consumer debt has tripled. So the average American has, and this is, uh, this is just mind-boggling to me, but not, not including the home, but the average American will carry between twenty-five dollars to $35,000 worth of debt. Not including their house. Not including their house. Oftentimes, they're get, probably cars or student loans more than anything else. So the average American will carry an $8,000 debt on their credit card. 
that said that um, over the years, America has progressed to where a little better than 40% have been guilty of spending more in a year than they earn. That's strong. Think about what I just said. Said that the personal bankruptcies recorded has doubled in the last 10 years. And by the way, the report that, that I read was not even up to date, so it would probably be worse being it was pre-COVID before these numbers came out. It says many people are going to have more month at the end of their money, and they will simply put it on a credit card. Gallup Poll said that when interviewed, 64% of couples in America worry about their finances. With all that being said, you know that our church has been extremely, extremely active in worldwide missions. And because of that, we have churches planted all over the world, and I have been in many of them. And did you know, compared to the places that I have been, America is filthy rich in spite of all that I just said? I still will never forget preaching at the, at the conference in, in Romania we had first gotten into Romania before we actually had started some works and in getting some inroads into Moldova. But I was in Romania and I was preaching. It was that they had this, this Colosseum there and, 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 and I was preaching uh, on, on a Tuesday, Monday and Tuesday night. And, um, and my interpreter and I were talking. And, uh, and so he just asked me, he said, now, now, do you have a house? And I said, yeah, yeah, I have a house. You, you, you own the house. Well, they're used to living in apartments that are owned by the government. So the fact that I owned a house was like, really? You own a house? Yeah. He said, do you have a car? And I'll never forget. I said, well, I have two cars. He said, do you realize what we take for granted most of the world looks at in amazement? And that would fit pretty much the majority of people that I'm talking to right now would be able to say the same thing. But the guy who was interpreting for me was in sandals, and, and, and at night we, we hung out together, and I had these, that, and I had just bought them before I went on that trip, which was a dumb mistake on my part. These, these Nike um, uh, shorts and, and a Nike shirt, and, and, and he just, he loved, we, we, we talked during the night before we go to bed. He loved it. And, he, and before it was over with, I said, here. <laughs> because he was like, wow. And I'm like, we're spoiled people. In all honesty, we're much more spoiled than, than we want to admit. And so I would say to us, the truth is, we as American citizens, and I'm not, I'm not down on America. I'm glad I'm born in America. But I can tell you that it's not because we don't make money. It's because we don't manage money. It's why many of our people are in the mess that they're in. And I would say that um, if you don't learn to manage your money with God giving you plenty of biblical principles, then I do believe you'll answer to God for it. I believe you should be a good steward of what God has blessed you with. And I believe all of us should have that mindset to, that we want to be a good steward of what God has blessed us with. And I mean, you know me and I know you. I've been around a long time and, and some of the principles I'm giving you are not going to be new. Uh, matter of fact, most of you think I do well as far as managing money and I try to be smart with it. But, but I'm simply going to say to you, all one has to do to do well is follow biblical principles and you'll do fine. Interesting. We love to make fun of, and, 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 and I know we probably is not as as popular to do as it was at one time because we don't want anybody to view anybody else as being anti-Semitic. But, but, but I will say that a lot of people will make light of or make fun of Jewish people because of how they hoard money is, is the word I've heard used. But truth be known, most Jewish people are just following Old Testament Jewish principles in the Word of God. And they're following it because they work. And so maybe what we need to do is have a biblical perspective of finances. Are y'all bored yet? Or are y'all with me? Okay, thank both of y'all. All right, for the rest of y'all, I want you to be with me, all right? And I want to talk about some things, and I'm going to give you four biblical principles right from God's Word. In each, each statement, I'll show you right from the text where it comes from. That will help us. We'll go much more in depth as we go over, over the next several weeks. But truth be known, there's only three things you can do with money. Only three things. Here it is. You can spend it, you can save it, or you can give it. Or if you want to alliterate it, you can spend it, save it, and share it. How about that? 
That's the only three things. So let's talk about money. Number one, I want you to be correct in how you see your money. Go back to verse 7. I told you where, we, where we'd be coming from, so go to verse 7. Verse 7 says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. I, um, I want to I make the statement that I've made before, and, and I have now been corrected. I have said more than one time, you will not see a U-Haul tagged behind a hearse. And I've done that to emphasize that you brought nothing into this world, and it's certain you'll take nothing out. And after I did that on a Sunday morning, we, the kind of people I pastor, decide that they're going to send me pictures of a hearse that is pulling a U-Haul. And so I cannot say now, because I received oodles of pictures after that sermon on a Sunday morning of saying that, of, of a U-Haul behind a hearse. But I will not back away from this. You can put a U-Haul behind that hearse, but it still is not going with you, okay? You can stuff it in your casket, but it is still not going to go with you. God's Word is correct. You brought nothing into this world, and it is certain you will carry nothing out. So, who owns the money that you have? If I were to say, who owns the cash that's in your pocket? Who, who owns the money that is in the bank? Who owns the equity in your house? If your answer is, well, I do. As a believer, your answer is wrong. Now, if that rubs you the wrong way, I want, to know, want you to know that it kind of does me as well. Because I try to be disciplined and, and, and try to uh, be able to put at least 15% of my income every month into, into investing for, for the future so that one day I'll not be hungry and my wife will not be hungry and we'll be able to live after, after I can no longer preach or pastor. And I think it's just wise to do that. I don't think it's unwise. I think it's very wise. And so I want to say mine. But the bottom line is, it's not an IRA account or a Roth IRA account or, or you could use other methods that, that uh, rental property or other things that you would get a, a, a net worth from. It's not those things that I need to depend upon to take care of me. I think I should be wise, and we'll talk about that in, at the last point. But it's God who's promised to take care of me. And it's good for me to hear and it's good for me to say. Because I believe that it is a true statement. The truth is, you do not own a single penny, and neither do I. You brought no money with you when you got to this earth, and you'll have no money with you when you leave this earth. And the worst mistake anybody can make about money is believing it is your possession exclusively. That's a mistake. Now, I am taught in the Word of God to be a steward of what God has blessed me to be in my possession. And that part I do believe God has blessed certain people in this auditorium. Some have been have received more than others. Some receive more than others on a monthly basis. Some receive less than others. But but whatever you receive, you are to be a steward of it. But it is a spiritual matter. You act like it's not, but it is. And when you recognize that you're a steward of what God has given to you to steward over for him, you then are on to something of a perspective that is biblical about money. And that's what I, um, what I want you to understand. I want to be smart with even how the church spends its money. I try to be really protective in the sense of, of you know, people ask all the time. I mean, it wasn't all long ago. I mean, I had a guy... Point blank asked me to give him a car, you know, and, and, and basically sees a church like this, and certainly you can buy me a car, you know, that kind of thing, that kind of mi mindset. And, you know, truth be known, if I don't know somebody, I'm probably not all that to try to get behind them to help them have a car. I would think you'd be happy about that, that you'd want me to be wise with the money that God has blessed us and you give for this church. And I say to you, just like you expect me, me to be a good steward of the money that is in the coffers of this church, and we do try to do that, God expects you to do the same thing with what you have. And so the key to understanding money is it is God's if you're God's child and you're a steward of what God has given you. If you believe that, say amen. All right, number two, be committed in how you share money then. 
be committed in how you share money. Go to verse 9 and verse 10. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money, underline that, for the love of money, not money, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. That's a strong statement. And pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And so I put, first thing you've got to say, I noticed that it's the love of money and not money itself that leads to evil. And so the first thing you've got to ask yourself is, do you view the money as yours? And you should say, no, I view it as me being a steward of what God has blessed me to, to look over for him. But then secondly, do I love money? Now before you answer that, be honest. Because I'm afraid Way too many of us, if we had a lot of detector tests put on our fingers when we answered that question, the answer would be we do love money. And I, am, I know that money can do things for you. But I can say this without, unequivocally without, I was talking just the other day, I think it was Chris and I were talking about this, and I made the statement, there are certain people that have money that I would not trade places with for the world. And I mean that. Because what they have is woes and heartache. You say, well, I wish I had a few of those woes and heartaches. No, what they have is a love for something more than their God. And to me, that's a terrible place for a person to be. And I hope you feel that way. And if your pocketbook and your love of money is competing for, for the place that God should have, and that's the throne of your life, then, my friend, then I am talking to you. Can I tell you a good test and I've always said this, if you tell me or show me how you spend your time and how you spend your money, I will show you what you love. Do you believe that's a true statement? Just show me how you spend your time and how you spend your money, and I will have little to no problem saying that Earl, who I saw how he spent his time and how he spent his money, Earl loves, and I can fill in that blank fairly easily. And I could, he could do that to me, and we could go on and do that for each other. I will say, I will say, and I don't want to be hurt fuller, but I'm afraid some of us are guilty of giving God the leftovers when it comes to our life and when it comes to our pocketbook. And I believe that God deserves a much higher place. No, no, He does deserve a much higher place than that. And so in all that you do, whether we're talking finances, we're talking life, no matter what you do, God should be first. Interesting, Proverbs, which is just a book of wisdom. That's what Proverbs is. It's just a, you would do yourself a favor. There's 31 Proverbs, and you could read one every day of the month, and, and you will never regret doing that. It's the book of wisdom. Proverbs chapter 3, and there's several verses that talk about money, but interesting. Honor the Lord with thy substance, with the first fruits of thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. God is simply saying, when you put him first in your life, he will bless your life. Now, I, don't, I'm not, I, I know some televangelists are going to do the name it, claim it, and use that verse as part. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying give $100 in the offering today so you can get 1000 this week, and you know it came from God. No, I'm not doing that. The people that do that are false prophets. When I, when I read a verse like that, and I think about God, what I'm thinking about is everything in me should say God is first. My life, my time, my money. And I believe that I can tell you by experience that whenever I put God first, I have no regrets. But when I don't put God first, I have plenty of regrets. Anybody else like me? And so with that little thought in mind, what we need to recognize and realize more than anything else is God desires to be first and He deserves to be first. If you think I'm talking about giving to get rich, you don't understand at all what I'm talking about. I'm talking about God being first, and there is a difference. The vast majority of believers cannot manage their money because they have not put God in His Word first. Let's just bring it right down to where we all can understand it. The reason why they're not following, they think, they think, even though the Bible says that, 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 that the, you know, the, the borrower is slave to the lender. We all, we all know this in the Bible, but yet we go and buy cars on credit and we'll pay five and six years for a car and act like that verse doesn't apply to us. Well, it's no wonder we have heartache because we're disregarding principles in God's Word. 
And if you continue to disregard principles in God's word, then you're going to have the results. And it's not blessings. It's the opposite of blessings. It's woes. And I know in, 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 you know when you get to talking about this, people get all smug and mad and upset. But the bottom line is a lot of people are in the place they are because they've chosen to be there in disregarding biblical principles, in particular with finances. Number three, being you're loving me so much tonight, be consistent in how you save money. <clears throat> First Timothy chapter 6, verse 8, the Bible says, And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Boy, we need to memorize that verse, don't we? Having food and raiment, raiment let us be there with content. If that verse is true, and it is, I want everybody to look at me. I know I'm ugly, but I'm married. It don't matter. So look at me. Ready? 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 Everybody ready? Stop borrowing, borrowing money for things you don't need. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. If you can't pay cash for it, you don't need to buy it. Now, you can say that's your business and walk out and be mad at me for what I said. And you'd be correct, it is your business. But don't be surprised if you don't have a life full of woe because you disregard plain and simple godly teaching and godly principles. Dave Ramsey says that, that the vast majority of Americans today have not saved even close to 10% of what they need for their retirement. Well, the only one, one way that happens, you're not prepared. You're not giving 15% to your retirement, which is a pretty good number, by the way. You might want to do more. You might want to do less. Not a bad spot. Every time, I can't afford it. Well, one day you wish you had. Um, I know some of you think, well, the government will take care of me. Yeah, the government's really done a good job thus far. Most savings, most retirement accounts are done away with when major events take place like a job loss or medical seriousness or all kinds of things. Most people have no idea what an emergency fund is, for instance. I would dare say that just like the principles I live by for our church finances, that you would do yourself a favor to figure out exactly what you could, could live on for three to six months and never get a paycheck and put that in the bank and make sure you have what is called an emergency fund. You say, well, I, 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 I don't believe I could ever afford to do that. Well, if something happens that's an emergency and you can't bring in a paycheck, you're going to do it whether you thought you could afford it or not. You do yourself a favor. To, and when you talk about this, boy, people get I, the look I'm getting from some of y'all right now. But really, there's two ways to be wealthy, if you're going to use that phrase. Let me give them to you. Number one, you can make a lot of money. Or number two, you could want less. We'll holler amen on the first one, but no one wants to say, I want to want less. But the Bible is very clear God's going to take care of your food and your raiment. He's going to make sure you're his child. You're, he's not going to see a seed begging bread. But the latest and the greatest TV and, and phone. and Have y'all noticed people on the street? Oh God, I forgot I was going to say this, and I went right past it. But God, I want y'all to notice how many people begging on the street corners in their iPhone. Does that seem ironic to anybody but, but me? You got a $1,000 phone in your hand, and you're asking me to give you a dollar. Does anybody see a problem? Now, those that have good sense hide their iPhones, but most of them don't even have that kind of sense because I've seen iPhones. If you want to do what I do, just look on the ground close to the little, their little area that they're walking up and down, and you'll see it there, I'd say about 60, 70% of the time. Isn't that ironic? I need money, but I have an iPhone. I pay a Verizon bill or a whatever, T-Mobile or they're all in it now. I mean, you can get Clear Talk or T-Mobile or uh, what's, uh, what's that? The, the TV show. I mean, the TV provider now even has one. What's it called? Huh? 
Spectrum, yeah, Spectrum, thank you. So y'all could, y'all could write this sermon. I want you to understand, and I'm only looking out for your best interest because it's true. I, I, I really am. You have to do this for yourself. And it actually is wise. Biblical principle to put aside money for a time that, that possibly an emergency would take place. Which brings me to my last point. Be cautious in how you spend your money then. Love, verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Can you say that with me? But godliness with contentment is great gain. What a verse. Um, I'm going to give you some principles if that's true. And you're not going to love me any more than you do already. Ready? You don't have to have everything you want. You'll live. You don't have to have everything you want. Um, even if you have money, you don't have to have everything you want. Life is about choices. I am, I'm not even saying that, that, that it doesn't mean that you should not spend some money. I, I still remember the, I, I just was, I made up my mind. I did not want my two children to graduate um, from high school and college and never go to a country to see people that had so much less than what we had. I wanted them to go to India, but it was expensive to buy a, a plane ticket for them to go to India with me. But it was worth it to me. And I saved. Matter of fact, we saved for two years, and I put money in the account for two years so that Stacy and Leslie could go with me the next time I was preaching in India. And uh, I certainly wasn't going to ask the church to pay for that. It's, it's, but I felt like it was money well invested for them to, to go to an uh, area that would be considered third world and that they could see places where there's sewage in the street, where they could see truly what being poor actually meant, not versus what we define as poor. And I said, if it does for them what it did for me, it's, it'll be life-changing for And it was worth saving the money to have my kids to see India with me, to, to go hear me preach, which they've heard all their lives, but to see that. That wasn't an impulsive decision. That was a well-thought-out decision that I believe pays dividends today. Can I say to you, a lot of people spend large amounts of money impulsively and quickly, and that is a mistake. I'll tell you, don't buy a car first one you see on the lot. They tell you, well, it'll be gone tomorrow. There'll be another one, I promise. Be wise. I hope you realize you buy a new car how much walked out of your pocket the day you drove it off the lot? The percentages are astronomically a whole lot wiser if you want a new car. A whole lot wiser to get one, wiser to get one two years old. Where it has at least been kicked in the gut really hard for the depreciation. Now, if you're a new car salesman, I don't hate you. I'm just trying to help people keep money in their pocket. I'm helping people like Turi right back there right now. All right, you're a whole lot wiser. But it amazes me. I, 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 I tell this illustration because they've been long gone and moved away, and they're not here anymore. But, I mean, I, one family was in the point of bankruptcy. I mean, they were about to go bankrupt, and they said, Preacher, will you help me? And I've done this for several couples. And, and what I did was I said, I, we're going to meet. I'm gonna sit, we're going to write a budget out for you. And I paid their bills for them. Rose knows it. I paid their bills for like three, three months. Got them in the habit of doing it right. I just covered it. We met once a month, and we covered all the bills at one shot. They couldn't believe they could do that. But they didn't touch the money they could and, and 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 we covered it for them I did that for them I got out of debt got out of debt and what I'm about to tell you my wife can verify that it's true because you're not gonna believe it they were still in our church just back years ago we old building they come to my house and they're so happy because they've just bought a brand new car and the payments weren't but and I looked at him like, have you lost your mind? Do you know what we did to get you to where you are? We qualify now. I don't want you to qualify. I don't want you to buy it. I, um, I want to tell you, don't buy impulsively. And you don't have to have everything you want. I'm going I'm to give you one little tidbit, and I'm going to move on to the second one. All right? I've got a couple of minutes. This is really especially true for young married couples. 
Because for some odd reason, they see the house and the furnishings and the car that mommy and daddy drive and forget that mom and dad's been married for 30 years and they're not where they were or they used to be and they didn't have all those things then. It took time. But they want what mom and daddy have now. And sometimes some of you think you're helping your kids by making sure they had them when they're grown adults and you don't let them go through the process and you're as bad as they are. I don't care if you get mad at me. I am right. And I like being right. I'm saying to you right now, it is good, it is good for a young married couple to wait and to get it slower, not faster. It's not bad. You're not being a bad parent because you let that happen. You're being a wise parent. And I would say, I would say, we don't have to have everything we want. Number two, being you love me so much. God cares about the 90% as much as he does the 10%. Away with this mindset, well, I gave God 10%. It's my business what I do with the rest of it. That is not true. You cannot substantiate that statement with the Word of God. You cannot substantiate that statement with the Word of God. I believe that God is as, as concerned about the, no, I don't believe, I know. God is as concerned about the 90% as He is the 10% because He wants you to honor Him with all of your substance. Just because you can afford something doesn't mean you should buy it. And I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, a shadow of a doubt, that God is not wanting you to be head over heels in interest payments. Especially on depreciating assets. That even doesn't even make sense. Depreciating assets. That's an oxymoronic word right there. Phrase. Because... The interest is helping somebody else get rich, and it's not you. Number three, major purchases should be bathed in prayer. You're going to buy a house? You've been living for God for these many years, and you haven't prayed about that? You're headed for trouble, in my opinion. I think you ought to pray about any major decision and I especially think if it's going to be something financial. I mean, I believe God's concerned. I believe you need wisdom. And my last principle, just giving you, and I could give you more, but it is two minutes and I'm done. If you have to borrow for a depreciating item, you are making a big mistake. Do not borrow for depreciating items. I know exactly what that means. I know you're looking at me like, I don't care what you say, I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah, you probably will. I have been your pastor for a long time. And I haven't had a car payment, and I can't tell you when. Now, I can't tell you I haven't bought a car. But I make payments to myself instead of paying interest to someone else. And when it's time to buy a car, we take the money to buy the car. I bought the, the Acura RDX that Rose is driving right now. And, and, and I went and sat down. And the guy, I, I didn't tell him I was going to pay cash for it not till, not, until the very end. And I pulled out a check. And he, you could tell he was like, what? And I said, and oh, he's telling me all the mistakes I'm making that I could use that. Then he commences telling me that I need to get the extended warranty because this car has electronics on it. I said, so is it not a good car? Should I not buy it? I love doing that to him, by the way. I had me a good time with him back and forth. But let me tell you, he wouldn't get any more money. Here's what the car cost. Here's what it was with its taxes, tax and tags. Here's what the check was from the bank. Here. And it just, you could tell it spoiled Christmas because they make more money on selling you the after. And if you work for a car dealership, I'm not telling a secret. They go to buy anywhere they can read this. In interest, they love you making payments. That's why oftentimes people don't even ask what the car costs. What will payment be? If you ask that question when you're buying a vehicle, you've already lost come to church to get my opinion I know not I know that's not true but that's a true statement nonetheless great way to honor God 
is with your finances, and I'm done. A great way to honor God is with your finances. You ought to give to God. Malachi, Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, all I'm going to say, well, a man robbed God, yet you've robbed me with your tithes and your offerings. You ought to provide for your family. The Bible says a man that provides not for his family is worse than an infidel. You ought to plan for the future. The Bible is very, very clear about that. The Bible says a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. And then you ought to be prayerful and wise with how you spend the 90% after you give to God. And I believe I've given you some sound biblical principles about finances. Bill's going to come due. Be prepared for it. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity that you've given me to share just some, some biblical truth about finances tonight. And, and we're going to do this for the next several weeks. And I pray, I pray you give Mark wisdom as he will share next week and then as we will tag team this. But Father, what's most important just for, for, for this month, just for the next just three more weeks, we're going to talk about a biblical, biblical perspective of finances. I pray that it will be a blessing to our people. In the name of Jesus, we ask this, and amen. I love you. I hope you're not mad at me, and I hope you have a great rest of the week. I'll see you Sunday.